Hello everyone. This is a presentation that I decided to put together on the topic of black holes. Um, black holes, of course, are very intriguing objects. They've continued to confound our intuition and they continue to force us to push the limits of our own understanding. Um, but first, in order to talk about black holes, um, I want to give a brief overview of the major developments in our understanding of the universe that have propelled our thought to such great leaps of imagination. And of course, the whole Odyssey story was the Sir Isaac Newton, uh, who published the Principia in 1687. Uh, surely the Principia is the most influential book in all of physics. It provided precise mathematical descriptions of the workings of nature. It provided the first grand unified theory of the universe. In the Principia, Sir Isaac Newton wrote the first mathematical formulation of gravity in that he formulated it in gravitational, in universal terms. And it was this great insight about gravity that Sir Isaac Newton had that confounded many people of the day, in fact, confounded Isaac Newton himself. In a letter to the theologian Richard Bentley, he wrote, and I read, that gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else by and through which their action or force may be conveyed from one to another is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters any competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws, whether this agent be material or immaterial is a question that I've left to the consideration of my readers. Um, so it was Newton's idea that gravity works on anything in universal terms, on small mass or large mass particles that sets the first stepping stone into any conception of black holes that we could have. Uh, indeed, Newton actually hypothesized that light is attracted to massive bodies, and the idea that light is also subject to the gravitational force is a great idea that our history of black holes should begin with. We often tend to think of black holes as a manifestation of, of 20th century physics. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, uh, the concept that, uh, that a very compact, uh, a body that's compact enough such that its gravitational force would become so strong that not even light would escape was actually uh, dreamt up by uh, in the 1700s by the English priest Jean Mitchell and uh, the famous French physicist Pierre Laplace. There's actually lots of evidence to show that it was uh, Jean Mitchell who came, who first came up with this idea. However, Laplace's were also very essential to our understanding of, uh, of, of black holes because um, he asserted that gravity is the only reigning force in the sky and in, in his exposition of the systems of the world which he published in 1795 using Newtonian physics he calculated what we know of as the escape velocity. And this is the velocity that needs to be imparted to any object so that it could break away from the gravitational uh, pull of a planet or a star and fly away into space. Uh, incidentally, we know that the escape velocity of the Earth is 11 kilometers per second. Um, and Laplace uh, essentially uh, reasoned that if the initial velocity is less than the escape velocity, the gravitational force would kind of decelerate the motion of, of, of an object. Uh, but what if the escape velocity is greater than the escape velocity of light? So light essentially would not be able to escape and we wouldn't be able to see it. It is important to stress, however, that actually Laplace and Mitchell didn't really know about the universal speed limit. And it's also important to stress that their conception of uh, black holes isn't exactly the same as the modern conception of black holes because they essentially treated uh, light as particles that are trying to escape, that, that escape but then are pushed back to the surface of the uh, of the object they're escaping from uh, through the pull of gravity. However, in, in our modern conception of black holes, however, light escaping cannot even leave the surface at all. So it's kind of a different idea. Uh, their black hole is essentially just black. The whole part is, is kind of missing. And um, and uh, but it's also important to note that uh, Laplace actually abandoned this idea of escape velocity and in later. Uh, in later editions of the exposition of the systems of the world, um, this idea is kind of edited out completely. It wasn't until the 1950s when Einstein formulated his revolutionary general theory of relativity that we finally had a consistent theory of how gravity could affect light. He famously proclaimed that mass acts in space-time telling it how to curve, and space-time acts in mass telling it how to move. Einstein also formulated his field equations, which relate the curvature of space-time to the gravitational field. A very short time afterwards, Carl Schwarzschild formulated his solution to Einstein's field equations and indicated that the curvature of space-time increased around massive objects. He formulated this famous concept of Schwarzschild radius, which is 
uh, Berenius that if you compress all the matter down to, the object will become a black hole. And you can actually calculate this for the Earth. In fact, if you subst if you plug in the values uh, into the equation R equal T G M over C squared, G is the new new Newton's gravitational constant, M is the mass of the object, and over C squared. So if you if you have the mass of the Earth and you find that you plug it into this equation, you'd get the value that you would need to compress all the matter down to, such that uh, all the matter of the Earth down to, such that the Earth would become a black hole. Um, this was beginning. Uh, this conception of black holes is beginning to diverge from the classical conception because, in in this case, the speed of light is absolute and space and time are relative. Around the same time, the notable Indian scientists Subramanian Chandrasekhar formulated the famous uh, concept of Chandrasekhar's limit, and this is actually the maximum mass that a star could support itself against its own gravity after it runs out of, of fusion. Uh, so it's it's actually runs uh, behind. It runs on the idea that. Uh, the gravitational collapse is uh, is supported is prevented by a degeneracy pressure uh, that 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 is that is the result of the quantum physics of the electrons that, that the stars contain. Um, however, Arthur Eddington, at the time, who was a major physics and uh, who, who was a, who was a major figure in um, Einsteinian physics, actually did not did not really like this idea. He abhorred this idea very much, and he actually rubbished Chandrasekhar's work. Um, Einstein also didn't didn't like uh, Trollside solution. Uh, uh, Swarlside work as a uh, work implied, as I said before, that there is this radius that depends on the mass where the density inside the sphere goes to infinity, and where Einstein's equations essentially become meaningless. So Einstein saw it as some sort of a disaster to his own uh, theory. And in fact, Einstein wrote a paper in 1939 claiming that singularities could not exist in physical reality. However, actually, a few months afterwards, Oppenheimer and Snyder actually showed the inevitability of a collapse of, of sufficiently massive stars um, uh, to form a black hole uh, in the context of general relativity when there is nothing to prevent the condensation of, of matter. Um, essentially, the relative density of, of mass energy uh, becomes so great that no form of energy could escape even light. And um, in doing so, um, Oppenheimer and Schneider referred as, uh, indicated that it would, it would essentially cut itself off from the world, producing what we now what we know of today as, as a black hole. Um, it's important to know that even though I keep mentioning the word the word black hole throughout this lecture, the term black hole didn't actually enter the astrophysics lexicon until much later in the 16s uh, in, in, in the 60s when John Wheeler coined this term and when he actually uh, uh, revived Oppenheimer Snyder's work and. Uh, he was uh, John Wheeler was essentially instrumental in bringing in bringing the recognition uh, in bringing about the recognition of black holes in the astrophysics uh, world, uh, community. But there was also mysteries on to what happens to a star collapsing into a black hole, and further work by Oppenheimer and other scientists showed uh, indicated that this entirely depends on the observer. Um, so, because of the strong gravity exhibited by by the star, time would actually pass uh, more slowly near the surface of the star. So, a stationary observer uh, who is stationary, who is at rest at a safe distance uh, from a star, would actually see radiation from the collapsing star gradually uh, shifting to the red portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. There would be this combined um, action of the Doppler effect and dime dilatation, dime dilation effects. Uh, combined with strong gravitational field would actually make the star um, invisible and its image would quickly vanish from view in 100 thousandths of a second uh, for one, one solar mass. As seen from the perspective of the observer, the object might uh, seem to take forever to fall in because of the time dilation effects. And as far as this external observer is, is concerned, uh, the point that would mark the place uh, surrounding a black hole where time stops completely would be this Schwarzschild radius. Um, it's also uh, important to note that an observer who's riding on the surface of, of, of this collapsing star, however, would see things a little bit differently. Uh, this observer would pass right through the Schwarzschild radius um, in uh, quite a short time for one solar mass that equals 100 thousandths of, of a second. As I've just uh, indicated, um, black holes were worked in such in, in so great theoretical terms 
before there was actually any experimental proof for them. And one of the earliest experimental proofs for, for the existence of black holes came uh, from the work of the astronomer Martin Schmidt, who actually discovered quasars that have very large redshifts, and they were essentially very bright, but also so far away. So it su suggested that it must have formed by the gravitational collapse of entire regions of, of the galaxy. And um, later, there was also the discovery of pulsars by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And pulsars are uh, essentially rotating neutron stars. So uh, if, uh, if it, was, it was thought that if stars could collapse to such a small size, then it's not entirely impossible for a star to collapse to an even smaller size and, and essentially become a black hole. There was also the observation of systems such as Cygnus uh, X1, and, and these are systems where you'd see stars orbiting around an, uh, an, an, an unseen companion, and essentially matter would be blown off from the star. It would actually uh, this, uh, it would actually develop into a spiral motion. It would get very hot. Um, it would um, uh, emit X-rays. Essentially, uh, the matter kind of uh, uh, d develops uh, jets of plasma, which generate magnetic fields, and which then uh, get very hot and as a result they emit x-rays. Um, and it was actually uh, worked out that the lowest possible mass of, uh, of this uh, unseen companion was actually six times the mass of the Sun, which is too large for a wide drive, uh, too large for it to be a wide dwarf, and too large for it to be a neutron star. So it's, 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 uh, it's kind of, it, it's just perfectly right for the mass of, of a black hole. There's also this time lapse that I want to show here, and it shows um, time lapse of the center of our own galaxy. It shows characteristic elliptical orbits of uh, of certain stars, and if you actually look at the uh, elliptical orbits and you look at the time that it takes those stars to rot rotate around this unseen object, and it would show you that the mass of this unseen object is actually uh, 3.4 million times the mass of the Sun, um, which confirms that it, it is indeed a black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Um, this this time lapse was taken over a 15 year period from uh, 2002 uh, from sorry 1992 to 2006 I believe um, and it, it was uh, one of the best indirect uh, evidence for the existence of, of, of a black hole at the center of our own galaxy. This brings me back to uh, 2015, one of the greatest uh, discoveries in, mm. in, in physics this, uh, this, uh, this century. It was the, uh, the, direct uh, the direct detection of uh, black hole merger and the direct detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO experiment. Um, I actually want to talk a little bit about this experiment because it's very intriguing. Um, uh, so the LIGO experiment consisted of, of, of interferometers that were spaced uh, apart widely at two different locations in uh, Washington and Louisiana in the United States. And uh, these are the instruments that, uh, they look like this, these are the instruments that made possible uh, the discovery of gravitational waves, which I just mentioned as a prediction made by Einstein's uh, general zero relativity. Um, and uh, it was the prediction that uh, gravitational, uh, uh, so this, exp this experiment actually runs on the prediction that gravitational waves would actually cause some sort of a distortion in the medium of space time and essentially would, um, elicit uh, some sort of a mechanical or electromagnetic propagation um, in the medium of space-time. Um, and it was, uh, this, this is the reasoning that's behind the, the setup of this experiment. So as you can see in this diagram, um, essentially in the interferometers, uh, there is a laser source that uh, produces a monochromatic light beam that's kind of incident um, onto a beam splitter at 45 degrees. Um, the beam splitter reflects half of the incident light onto a second mirror and transmits the rest of it onto a third mirror. Um, so the beams kind of reflect at the second and third mirrors and then they recombine at the beam splitter and they form some sort of an interference pattern um, and also they form a wave that's traveling downwards towards the photodetector as you, as you can see in, in the diagram. So uh, the gravitational waves would essentially kind of elicit some sort of a of a distortion that has a quadruple nature, so kind of waves uh, waves would be would stretch along one axis, but they would also shrink along an orthogonal axis. And if no gravitational waves are present, then light would travel the same distances along both arms, and a, perf a perfect interference would kind of divert all of the light back to the source. 
no light would uh, fall onto the photodetector if there is, if there is essentially there is no gravitational waves. However, if there is a passing gravitational wave, it would kind of cause, cause the, the lengths of both arms to change uh, in a very slight manner, such that the, the positions of the mirrors actually change and disrupt the destructive interference pattern, and then causing the light to uh, actually fall onto the photodetector and finally a, a photocurrent to appear. Uh, some people may ask, like, why is why is it crucial that uh, you have two experiments that are conducted at the same time at, at two different locations? But this is very important because uh, a gravitational wave that's traveling through uh, uh, through us must cause the same interference effect simultaneously at both locations for it to be taken seriously. Um, this result would kind of confirm that the effect that is observed was actually caused by a gravitational wave and not some sort of any incidental noise, for instance, uh, thermal, seismic, acoustic, or otherwise. Um, I should mention that LIGO is actually so sensitive that the gravitational waves with amplitudes as small as 5 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 22 uh, could actually be detected. And in fact, the, the recent uh, collision of black hole mergers that sent gravitational waves to us actually changed the lengths of these arms to one thousandth the size of a nucleus. So this is actually incredible engineering technological feat. The fact that you can detect uh, uh, the change in the lengths of these arms to one thousandth the size of a nucleus that is incredibly astounding, and it it is a, it is a discovery that has uh, that will usher in a new era of gravitational wave astronomy, and I look forward to whatever may come up from this remarkable technological achievement. This brings me uh, uh, to a more recent picture on our understanding of black holes, and uh, uh, for this. Uh, Regarding this, I want to speak about um, Hawking radiation. Um, in, in the 1970s, uh, Stephen Hawking um, shattered the notion of black holes being entirely black by discovering the phenomenon of, of Hawking radiation. Uh, before Stephen Hawking came around, it was commonly thought that nothing could escape a black hole. Uh, nothing could escape a black hole. So um, Hawking essentially uh, showed, by virtue of his calculations, that large black holes could actually emit radiation uh, by virtue of quantum fluctuations that occur at the event horizon um, of a black hole, as you, as you can see here in this in this diagram. And that uh, he also showed that he also showed that the classical restriction of nothing escaping out of a black hole does not actually apply when taken within the context of, of quantum mechanics. So effectively, the black hole radiates until eventually it dissolves and evaporates. Um, I want to expand more upon this idea, and this notion derives from the uh, no, uh, th this notion derives from the idea that uh, the vacuum of space time around the black hole is not in fact empty, but rather filled with um, uh, virtual pairs of particles and antiparticles that appear by virtue of, of, of quantum fluctuations. Uh, this is kind of required by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which kind of denies us the possibility of, of ascribing a precise location and motion to an object. So what happens is that the particles uh, essentially, uh, the particle pairs essentially pop out of nothingness and dematerialize in uh, an empty space for a fraction of a second before annihilating together. Um, this time is of course very short, but however it is long enough for the particle pair to uh, to separate before annihilating. So one of the pair, one of the pair of particles that appeared near the event horizon would be captured, while the other half would escape. And uh, to an observer, it would seem that the black hole had, had emitted uh, thermal radiation. Um, but this is not what happens entirely. Um, in order to balance out the radiation energy release that, uh, that has occurred because of the particle that has tunneled out, uh, there, that means some sort of a decrease in, in total mass of the black hole. So as a black hole decreases the mass, the process of dissipation accelerates at an ever-increasing rate, and uh, to an external observer, it, it appears, uh, to an external observer, it appears, it would appear to have eventually uh, dissipated all of its energy. Uh, Hawking's work also showed that it was possible to use the mass of, of, a, of a black hole to calculate uh, its temperature, and also that it was possible to calculate the intensity of, of this uh, Hawking radiation. So, Counterintuitively, the temperature of a black hole is actually inversely proportional to its to its mass. Uh, the black hole emits radiation as that of a black body. Um, the smaller the black hole gets, the higher the, the temperature that it would produce as as it decays quickly, and uh, thus the higher the rate of radiation as well. 
so prim primordial black holes uh, that have masses that are less than 10 to the uh, mass less to, to 10 to the power of 15 grams are thought of, to have all evaporated by now. However, there is, has been no verifiable observational evidence for any such tiny black hole events. Um, and in fact, the largest black holes in the universe would actually take up until 10 to the power of 100 years to evaporate so that changes in their mass could ever be perceptible. So it's, it's, uh, it's, too, it's, it's a great time for our lifespans to, to allow. Uh, building on the work of uh, another physicist uh, whose name was Jacob Bekenstein, um, Hawking's work also showed that there is a relationship between the, um, the surface area of a black hole and its entropy. So in, in, in a black hole merger, the total surface area of the event horizon is, is, is greater than the sum of the event horizons of, of the two individual black holes. And this is kind of a property that's analogous to the second law of thermodynamics. A black hole that radiates a real particle loses entropy but uh, that does not actually violate the law of thermodynamics because the combined entropy of the black hole and the radiated particle is greater than the individual entropy of the individual black hole. Uh, mysteries about black holes continue and um, for instance one of the greatest questions is whether the information that is uh, observed by a black hole is destroyed and lost forever or whether it might be recovered from the phenomenon of Hawking radiation. And this is a very fundamental question in modern physics. Um, this is all I have to say about black holes at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for listening.